Well, good afternoon, and uh, let me invite the panel to join me here. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, actually, this conversation, as Alexandra was saying, follows very naturally from uh, the talk she just gave, um, because this, you know, Turkey is a, if you want to describe it this way, a key uh, swing state. Turkey has also just had a very important, at least first round election, and I don't think it's going to surprise anyone to say that, well, it was a surprise for many people. Uh, we have a wonderful group of people here to talk to us about how to decode that, but also how to think through what might be coming next, both for Turkey and for Turkey's partners, and how we might engage Turkey in the future. And let me just uh, introduce them to you briefly. Uh, to my right, uh, Selin Nasi, who is with the Ankara Policy Center, actually based in London, and is now also uh, has a hat at the London School of Economics as well. Uh, and Soli Özel, uh, professor at Kader Has University in Istanbul, and Sergei Lagarinsky, member of the European Parliament, and also chair of the EU-Turkey delegation. So. Thanks to all three of you for joining us. Um, let me maybe just start this way uh, and ask you, what happened? <laughs> Soli, <laughs> I mean, we all, it's well. no surprise that people, you know, had a, a preference, but it is slightly surprising that the pollsters and everyone else got it so wrong. I, you know, my favorite philosopher is Yogi Berra. I tried to emulate him, and I'll start with one of his most famous um, aphorisms. It's because you said you're also going to ask about the future. I don't make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> uh, sex, so first aphorism about your question is uh, accurate polling is basically an oxymoron across the world. Um, and uh, another one is uh, Turkish politics these days is like uh, Henry Ford's model T car. You can have any color politics you want so long as it's nationalist. Um, and uh, thirdly, <laughs> I think this was an election when um, one part of Turkish society has actually dictated what it wanted its political representatives to do. They just fell short. Uh, that that was the opposition. And I think the opposition's main parties, I think the, the table of six was unnecessary, but the, the, the main two parties, E Party and CHP, actually failed in representing that energy. Uh, but it was against really, really very tough odds as well. One, I mean, it was not a free election, it was not a fair election. All state resources had been used and abused uh, by ministers, by, by everyone. And in the post-truth age, I think we have become champions of post-truth as well, especially when the media is controlled by at, at the rate of 90% by those, by those in power. Um, the Kurds um, made a bet. Uh, I think one of the reasons why the difference may be so uh, high is that of the people who chose not to go to the polls, which was about 10 or 10% 10 of, the, of the electorate, um, it appears that in the metropolitan centers, those were overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly Kurdish. What was really truly surprising, and maybe it shouldn't have surprised us, was that neither the economic calamity we find ourselves in nor the earthquake, the calamitous earthquake, and the abysmal performance of the government seem to have made much of a difference, and that is something that will need to be analyzed. Finally, about the future, um, one, we will have election, I mean, we will have a second round for the presidential election, and quite frankly, in this new system, pres presidential election is the only one that counts politically. Uh, <laughs> Two ultra-nationalists have chosen to go their separate ways, one supporting the government and the other the opposition. I think the one supporting the government will not really make much of a difference. The other one may bring one or one and a half points. So the, I think the election will be determined by those who do not go to the polls on Monday. As for our relations with the rest of the world, uh, let's, let's okay. let's, we'll we'll okay. come back to that, but okay. let me also ask you, and maybe I, this is a, a good transition to you, uh, Selin. I mean, is it absolutely certain that Erdogan is going to come out on the 28th as the winner? Well, um, he, has, he, he has an advantage over uh, the main opposition leader, and um, I think we overlooked the nationalist wave. 
the nationalist, we had nationalist parties in both uh, sides. The, the MHP uh, from the uh, from the alliance, Erdogan, uh, raised, increased its votes. Uh, pollsters predicted that it was going to uh, get about 5%, but it, it, uh, it had uh, about uh, 10, 11%. Uh, and then the good party on the nation alliance, it received also, it remained its position. So um, President Erdogan uh, really played this nationalist card well. He showcased uh, Turkey's accomplishments in the defense sector, which we, we should all be proud about. Uh, but uh, it was striking for me to see that um, people uh, cared more about uh, tanks and warships uh, than uh, whether or not they would be able to provide their kids proper proper education or whether or not they're going to have the means to provide their kids that education to build those tanks and warships in the first place. So we need to, uh, I think, uh, understand and explain why uh, is this resilient uh, vote share uh, Erdogan has. Um, and uh, many experts point to identity politics. Of course, it surely has an impact, but there I see an economic side to it. Uh, you would say the eco you have the uh, economic meltdown, uh, inflation is soaring, you have uh, budget deficits and life standards are deteriorating. Yes, that is true, but the, the government's uh, spending, uh, I think, uh, changed the perceptions this early retirement program offered uh, eligibility for over uh, 2 million people. And then we had the uh, in inflation plummeting uh, due to base effects. And so this all changed perceptions that the economy wasn't, the government wasn't doing so, doing so bad. But there is another side to it. Uh, I see two major groups that benefited from uh, Erdogan's ruling, governance. Uh, the first ones are the well-to-do ones who benefited immensely and prospered over the t uh, two decades uh, thanks to the clientelist networks the AK Party provided. They surely didn't want to lose their privileged position. And then we had the low-income families, let's say, and most of them received state aid. Between uh, 2019 and 2020, uh, the number of people who receive state aid increased by 187 percent. Mm. By 2020, 32 percent of the population was receiving state aid. So this means that the poorer they get, the vital the state aid becomes for them. Uh, and also, we should take into account uh, when assessing the AK parties, I'm wrapping it up, uh, as a party who has been in power uh, for 20 years, more than 20 years, uh, its party organization penetrated to Turkish society on all levels. And I saw what it means uh, in, in action. I volunteered for the Vote and Beyond Civil Society organization and observe, as an observer, I took part in the voting process, vote, vote, vote monitoring process. And uh, on the day of the election, uh, elections, there were two representatives from the AK Party, and uh, they were almost acquainted with the people who came to vote. They knew their names, they greeted, they, they did small talk, small talk, but it matters. And at the end of the day, we had about an hour to, for, to the closing, uh, closing of the polls, and uh, I overheard their conversation. They were, uh, they were asking why uh, Uncle Hassan's daughter didn't show up. And the other one was saying, oh, she's working at the mall. That is why she probably couldn't get mm. permission. And they made a few phone calls, and uh, seven or eight more people turned up that day. So this is what the Republican People's Party, the main, main opposition party, is competing mm. against, and we need to take into account yeah. this. I mean, they did well. They surpassed our expectations, but there is a long way to go for them yeah. to get there. No, it's a very, thank you, and it's a very telling anecdote because it tells you something about the skill and the, the, the populist political uh, nuance with which AKP has operated uh, across Turkey in recent years. But I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're telling us in a sense a story about something that we, we can now understand in different ways why it may have happened. Um, but 
is it durable? I mean, there is now this question. I, I don't think, it, again, it's any secret that I in Europe and in the United States, many people were not wishing for this outcome, and in part because they wanted a different kind of Turkey, a different kind of democracy in Turkey. And this is above all a question for Turks, obviously, but it also relates to European interests and American interests. Sergey, maybe I can turn to you with that. And you know, if you'd like to say a word about what you've heard, please do, but also maybe just say a little bit about how this could affect uh, European interests. Yeah. Well, this would have had affect uh, Turkish interests in the first place, because what we will be seeing is, and this is my concern, I'm one of the few in the parliament who still believed in Turkey's membership in the EU, not uh, next year, but uh, the perspective should be open to that. And I think one of the uh, consequences of um, uh, continuing the track, uh, if the new president and new government uh, will continue the same trajectory, will be that the process of uh, divorcing e European Union and Turkey will be irreversible. Uh, we already now are doing our best in order to freeze but not cancel uh, the process um, perspectives uh, for Turkey to be a member. Um, I think that uh, what, what happened now, what is happening now, will solidify the alliance of two forces, of those who are anti-Erdogan for legitimate or illegitimate reasons, but mostly for legitimate reasons, and those who are anti-Turkey. This is a big majority, uh, and I see this in the parliament. The majority of those who think that Turkey does not belong to the European Union civilization because it's Muslim, because it's Oriental, because you name it, uh, which I don't share, of course, and those who legitimately criticize this government. And this is the majority that will be solidified now by this result, and we will have, and we'll have another five years to fin finalize the divorce between Turkey and EU as an institution in terms of membership. And this is something that I'm very concerned, and this is a blow to European interests, but it is also a big blow to the interests of the Turkish, of the Turkish people from my perspective. Um, so this is, uh, this is number one, and um, regarding the outcome, yes, many of us were, I of course, as a, as a counterpart to our Turkish, the Grand Assembly, I am non-partisan uh, in that sense. Uh, but of course, many of us projected magical uh, magical skills on the opposition. Mm. We thought you can win elections even without level playing field. <laughs> level playing field was destroyed for more than five, ye five years, and we still thought, but the opposition is so skillful, it's so strong, and the citizens of Turkey are so wise in their decisions that they will still despite the media, despite the social society that was cleansed um, uh, in, many, in many areas, social media uh, attacks and many political prisoners, they will, in a sense, prevail. Well, what we see is that propaganda works, that culturals, cultural war, uh, wars pays off, and uh, that level playing field is something that makes elections not only unfair, but it also makes the elections not free. Hey, Sergey, thank you very much. Uh, we, we don't have a lot of time. I do want to save a little bit of time for some comments or questions from the room. So if you have some, please do get them ready and we'll save some time for that. But I want to come back to you uh, on this question, if we could shift to, you know, what does this mean now? I mean, what kind of Turkey are you going to have? And maybe I can split that into two parts. I mean, in Turkey, yeah. domestic public policy, this weird management of fiscal policy and, and, and so on. Uh, monetary policy, rather, other things, uh, social policy, um, media freedoms, all of these issues inside Turkey. But then, of course, also there's the external piece. But maybe just on the internal piece, very quickly That's first. Right. Celine, maybe quickly if internal. you like. Well, it's going to be a difficult time for anyone who voted for change in Turkey, obviously. Um, it's going to be a, a hard time for women uh, we have two conservative parties. One of them sees women uh, advocates for girls to marry when they reach puberty, and the other one advocates uh, for for <laughs> for the um, for that widowed women should be uh, adopted as if they are pets. So uh, even if the parliament has a very symbolic role in the pr executive presidential system, it is a disgrace. 
Uh, of course, it's bad news for uh, liberals, intellectuals, academics, uh, who, who want to have more oxygen, more freedom of expression uh, in, in the country. Uh, and for young people who wanted to live in a democratic country, probably uh, brain drain is going to accelerate. Mm. Uh, we can expect more purges. If, if Erdogan wins with a large margin, he will probably double down his repression on anyone who is not pro-Erdogan. <laughs> and, and in the run-up to the elections, most of the people revealed their true colors. Uh, expressing themselves in the social media, so it's going to be uh, very easy for the government to pick them. Uh, so it, 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 it's not going to be a very, very bright yeah. picture, I can say. And, the, and we are expecting an economic collapse right. right after the elections. All the experts are warning us. Soli, uh, you agree? Well, not to sound too optimistic, which I always am not. Uh, but there's a, there's a silver. <laughs> Sometimes you there's a silver lining, nonetheless. AKP has lost seven points from the last elections. Erdogan lost two and a half points from the last elections, in spite of everything that mm. we have just described. So the the uh, momentum for change is there, and quite frankly, although we now have ultra religious conservatives kind of bordering on jihadists in parliament that he brought in, the rising wave in the country is secular nationalism. And whether or not that will develop into a more democratic secular nationalist path or more autocratic one remains the big question. The two nationalist leaders who joined the the two sides are not necessarily known for their great respect for multiculturalism or mm -hmm. pluralism and whatever, but nonetheless, that's a fact. Finally, look, you have to give cr some credit to, uh, as Sergei said, to the Turkish um, society. At about 48%, it resists calamity after calamity, yeah. brutal attack after brutal attack. And as for the European Union, which has been totally oblivious to that energy, which of course burst out right after the immediate, in the immediate wake of the earthquake, that is something that they need to ask themselves whether that was the right attitude. Because, again, please do not misunderstand me, anyone. Our problems are our problems. It's our responsibility to solve them. But to say, sitting in the European Union, Oh, we've done everything to accommodate them, but you know, Turks, hopeless case. That was a bit, a bit condescending, and I think it was also wrong, and it was the wrong kind of investment into the future of the relations between Turkey and the European Union, in my mind. Sully, thank you. Sergey, I'm going to le let you say a word about that, but I also wanted to shift, because I'm conscious of our time, to, to the foreign policy piece. Uh, and in particular, you know, on, there's a whole list of issues. We're not going to get to them all, but you know, there are things, uh, Swedish membership in NATO, S-400s, uh, Russia sanctions, uh, uh, stability Med. in the East Med, uh, it goes on. Huh? Here, yeah. uh, some of these are for Europe, some for the United States, some for both, some NATO, some EU. Um, just broad gauge on the foreign policy piece. Um, what can we expect from a new Erdogan mandate? Well, Mr. Putin will probably present to us a big bill. Mm -hmm. He hasn't been paid for the gas that he sold Turkey. Uh, and apparently he was... I mean, he knows Mr. Rogan, and I understand Mr. Aliyev may have intervened in, the, in his choice and all that. Uh, in Syria, I don't see a reconciliation as the Saudis are back and uh, Mr. Assad is very comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, so with there will be a Washington? Huh? With Washington? Uh, Washington is going to be the big issue. That is an S-400s. For, mm -hmm. for, for Washington, S-400s plus Sweden's accession. Mm -hmm. And for Turkey, of course, the American support for PYD, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. an extension of that. And what will, uh, Celine, if I may, I mean, on, S on, for example, Swedish membership in NATO or S-400s, I mean, is this new... Erdogan mandate going to change things? What, what will happen? Ian, it is very difficult to make uh, rational explanations when it comes to Turkish foreign policy because one man decides for everything and his only orientation is to remain in power and to rally his supporter base. 
But I can say I don't expect very dramatic U-turns. Turkey will continue to c this, this um, strategic autonomy, quote-unquote, mm. policy. Uh, it, not only it, is it is not only driven by leadership preferences, but also the international political environment is susceptible to it and uh, compels middle powers like Turkey to hedge one way or, or the other. Because Turkey will be drifting, in the case that Erdogan wins, because Turkey will be drifting away from uh, Western, uh, drifting into further authoritarianism, uh, this will uh, be a ad legitimate excuse for uh, our European fellows to continue relations in a transactional manner. Uh, I think the only constant we can depend on is the economic economy, the economy, state of economy in Turkey, economy will probably act as a constraint to prevent uh, political elites uh, to engage in costly foreign policy endeavors. Uh, but of course, with the rise of nationalism in Turkey, that is something that we cannot foresee how it's going to impact Turkey's strategic alignment. Will Turkey take a further step to blur the lines and uh, cast a shadow on its NATO membership? Uh, as Soli uh, said, uh, what will Russia ask in exchange for the uh, financial support it provided? If under Russian pressure, for example, if you ask me whether or not Turkey is going to become an observer member in the Shanghai organization, cooperation mm. organization, I cannot with co confidently say no. Yeah. Okay, Sergei, so please. From our perspective, and thanks for giving me the cool, cooling down period after we, I've been, we were accused of uh, <laughs> doing the same no, thing. No, no, with well, you never Erdogan, know what you're going to get asked. Which is not true. Which is not true because <laughs> our European Parliament is very outspoken. I say Parliament. Uh, and ah. and the and we did give uh, before the elections. There was, a, as you know, we discussed this yeah. in Brussels on multiple occasions. We thought it would be un unwise to intervene uh, from the European side in order not to uh, give anyone a reason to instrumentalize our criticism. Uh, but we are very clear. What, where I agree with you is one thing. There is no strategy. There is no Turkey strategy of the European Union. Our strategy so far was accession process and the dancing around accession process. Someone against it, someone for it. I think that this dance is over. We need to discuss which, uh, com uh, how can we compartmentalize com mm -hmm. uh, the relationship. I think the geopolitical issues will remain. We will have to work together also as NATO members. Uh, and from that perspective, any step towards Putin will be detrimental for our trust relationship. I wrote a letter to the uh, foreign minister regarding Finland and Sweden right away and said that this is killing our trust, the little trust that we have, uh, that they are blocking this in an existential moment for members of the European Union. This will be a decisive issue with Sweden. We want Sweden in and Turkey should not try to inject their anti-terror standards through the door of NATO membership uh, by imposing it on us. We have enough criticism on Turkish own home standards on anti-terror legislation. They cannot expect that we will own them. And from that perspective, so the geostrategic uh, relationship should continue. On the economy side, we will need to reassess where we should go together, like the customs union, where we should also present our bill to our Turkish partners, like the credits, if, if it is about refinancing the Turkish economy. This will not go just because we love each other. We will also need to work uh, on a trans transactional and preconditional matter. Okay, we have time for, I think, we have a lot of hands, but we have time for maybe two express questions, Bill, right there, and then perhaps right here. So please, and do tell us, do introduce yourself. There's a microphone coming to you. Okay, let's perhaps take them together and then I can come back to you to finish. Please, if we could get the microphone back just right 
here, I think, would be perfect. Right, well, right in the front. We'll, we'll do all three of you. <laughs> Thank you, um, Isabel Massar, Georgia Tech. Um, you mentioned briefly um, situations in Turkey where women's rights are being compromised, but in hopes of gaining membership into the U EU, gender equi equality is fundamental to promote and continuously strive towards. How do you see hopes of membership impacting the rights of women, and how do you see the outcome of this election impacting that one way or another? Okay, thank you very much. And if you could perhaps pass it just there. Yes, thank you very much. Arba Kokalari, MEP from Sweden. Uh, thank you for um, uh, discussing the Swedish membership and the role of Turkey. Uh, can you be a bit more uh, concrete? What does it take for Turkey to uh, say yes to Sweden if, if, if Sweden really have fulfilled all criteria to become a, a NATO member? Uh, and what role can NATO as an organization do more uh, to make sure that other members actually help out in securing the, the common security, which I think Sweden has a big opportunity to do as a member. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. We have very little time left, so maybe in a very express way, if I could just come to you uh, to pick up on any water, gender equality, and Sweden. What would be necessary for NATO membership? So well, Sweden ahead. just changed its terrorism law so mm -hmm. that it's, it's if you're a member of an organization that uh, that is a terrorist organization, you can be, mm -hmm. that will be considered a crime. Uh, I think for Turkey, there is also a list of people that Turkey mm -hmm. wants extradited who, who will not be extradited. I was actually... Is it going to happen in the end? Huh? Is, he go is it going to happen? No. Is it going to get approved? What? Sweden. Swedish membership. Uh, I was, well, I think so, yes. Before, yeah. before Vilnius, I okay. think that will be said. And on the, the gender equality issue and water, I leave it <laughs> to you. Well, let me start with uh, weaponization of water resources. I don't expect in the short run, as I said before, because of the economic restraints, Turkey has uh, roughly since uh, early 2021 uh, because of economic concerns, uh, has been pursuing a foreign policy revision, the escalated tension in the East Med, and also uh, tried to mend, uh, launch a di diplomatic campaign to mend its relations with countries in the region. I think they're going to continue on that state of course uh, on this. Um, on gender equality, well, uh, we are very saddened by the fact that if uh, we would be, uh, it, it's going to be heartbreaking for all the women if, the, uh, uh, if Erdogan wins uh, and, and also the, we know the parties, conservative parties in the parliament, uh, they will not support uh, Turkey's going back to Istanbul uh, convention. Mm. Uh, but I still believe that uh, our EU, uh, EU uh, European friends should uh, maintain bridges with uh, the, the rest of the population in Turkey who voted for change, who voted for a democratic uh, Turkey. Uh, so uh, it, this is the only way that we can, uh, we, we can fight against uh, you know, uh, discrimination. Mm -hmm. Sergey, last just word. To follow up on this, I think it's not just the Istanbul Convention, even though we are all uh, were saddened uh, by the fact, because it was very symbolic, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that decision, but the domestic legislation to protect women um, is now un al also yes. under fire, yeah, and this could be back. next uh, mm -hmm. that will be uh, exactly. falling with the majorities that we have now in Parliament, mm -hmm. and we as European Union will be very outspoken on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, uh, again, my plea. Let us try to save the accession uh, process because the accession process, as you rightly said, gives us the platform to very clearly speak out our mind on fundamental rights, on judicial system, on many other things. I just met with LGBTI people from, the t from Turkey. There are so many problems that we could solve together. For that, let's try to get, back, to get it back on track. I'm not very optimistic, but I still have some little hope. Selim, Soli, Sergey, thank you very, very much for this conversation. It could have been much longer, of course. There were a lot of people who wanted to come in. I apologize for that. Uh, but a hugely important issue in a hugely important country, uh, and also, if I may add, a place where uh, GMF remains very committed. We have our office in Ankara, and it's super important for us to be there and to have these conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.